Hey, kia ora tato everyone. Yes, so I'm Jason Dawson. I'm currently Chief Executive of Hamilton Waikato Tourism. I'm living the dream. I've got an ultimate job where I sell something that I believe in, which is our region. So it's pretty cool. But look, life doesn't always end up this way. And it takes a long time, or maybe a short time, to find your dream role. Look, I never, I never woke up uh, one day and went, I want to be a pilot. Uh, I want to be uh, a fire engine driver or something. Um, I actually did wake up one day and when I was like about five or six, I want to be a school teacher. I loved my school teacher. Um, and I continued wanting to be a school teacher until I was about 11. And then my principal then, who I thought was just my hero, he was the ultimate Superman, he sat me down and goes, you want to be a school teacher? And he goes, don't be a school teacher. Don't be a school teacher. Don't be a school teacher. And when I see my teachers on strike now, it's like, oh no, oh no, he was right. Uh, but hopefully you'll get your pay and then you'll help shape continue. But teachers were such an important part of my life. And look, I totally took all the work of teachers. But So I didn't become a teacher. And look, we never, some of you don't. Like, you know, again, we're, we're quite clear about what we want to be, but um, I wasn't. I was one of those creative types, but like Sarah, um, we're kind of like all over the place. We want to do this, we love public speaking, we always want to be the front and acting, and oh, it's just getting too much. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, though, is about the rock bottom moments, because to end up in my dream role right now, um, it does it is a journey of losing your job, um, which happens quite a lot in life. I've probably lost my job maybe five times. Um, those are just some examples of some of the things that happen along my journey. Um, a takeover was really hard. Um, we were a beautiful little company, a startup company in the UK, uh, and we got taken over by this other big bad company. Uh, so we, so I left. Um, and then there was other takeovers that happened. We literally, we were a very different company, and we were taken over by a company with very different values. Uh, so many of us left. But there's look, there's downsizing in public sector. If you ever work in public sector, there's this great thing called restructuring. Uh, it seems to happen all the time. A new boss comes in, and they sit down, and they smile at you, and you have these great team meetings, and they restructure. And they say, but we really value your feedback. We want you to you know, tell us how you feel. And, you know, we're going to redeploy you. There's all these great new jobs we're going to create. You'll apply for it, and you don't get it. Okay? So that's what happens in life. <laughs> So I'm just going to try and talk through some of the feelings uh, that actually we have because look, it's quite a dark moment. You kind of, you lose your job through some way. And actually, um, I'll talk about actually walking away from a job sometimes because <laughs> I've done that twice in my career and people think, oh my God, you're so brave and so courageous. And I thought I was, you know, you think you're wearing this great big shield of doom. Um, you can push everything away. But then after a while you think, oh my God, have I made the right decision? Um, but you need to be true to your values, and I'll talk about that around turning it around. So look, when you lose your job, um, it is dark. I call it a living funeral, and the reason why I have slides um, is to make sure that I stick to the script and I prompt myself. Um, I call it a living funeral because when you do restructuring or you're the last man standing, which I have been in a couple of roles, um, it's really sad. Um, it's actually a huge grief goes through you. Um, it is like losing someone. You are losing potentially the people that you love working with. And your first two or three jobs in your lives, these people that you work with now will be the friends you will have for the rest of your life. Um, and they still are my friends in my life. And whenever I catch up with people and they go, oh, hey, you know this guy? And it's like, we all worked together in my first job or the second job or the volunteer group like C that you guys are part of now. That's how you guys make connections. And these people that you have around you now are the ones you'll have for life. So when that hurt happens in your first or second job, it really does cut you. It feels like... Your heart has been ripped out, and there's no other way to describe it. So, look, it does feel like a kick in the guts. Um, you live through this because it's not just around the departure and the farewell speeches and all that great stuff that goes with losing a job. It's actually the after stuff where actually your alarm doesn't go off because you don't have to get up at that time. Um, or you still wake up going, cool, I get to go to, oh no, that's right, I've got no job today. Um, so, <laughs> it's just this grief that you go through. So, look, I call it the living funeral. Uh, but the biggest one that we all have, and look, it's kind of touched on probably what Sarah talked about is your identity, is look, jobs give us a sense of purpose. You know, um, again, I'm of the generation where my grandfather and my father drilled into us this like ruthless, I call it, work ethic. Um, we never sat still. Um, we grew up on a farm originally. We would come home from school. We would literally be chopping firewood if it was winter. We'd be milking the cows. We'd be getting the potatoes peeled and the vegetables for mum, because that's all you had was meat, potatoes and meat and peas or something every night um, and we all had these jobs we had to bring in washing my brothers all had other jobs as well we would then go off to our after school work 
job and then we would come home. Um, so this work ethic was just drilled into us from day one. Um, so for us, look, when you, when you then wake up and you actually don't have a job, the first two weeks are cool. Um, it's kind of that reconnection thing, you can sleep in, you do what I call life admin, where you catch up on all that stuff that you've always wanted to do, you catch up with friends, you can even drink late, it's so cool, you can drink at lunchtime if you want to, uh, and you just slob, you know, you're just watching Netflix for days on end and binge watching and you're on social media, you know, because actually in busy lives, unfortunately you have to go on social media at like ridiculous times at night to find out what the hell's going on in the world, um, so you, but it's, Eventually it eats away at you and you just feel like that, um, what am I doing? And look, the other thing about the lack of sense of purpose is you feel like you've always got to justify it to the world that you're busy today. And especially if you have a significant other who's also paying the rent and you're not, um, and they come home and you're just like, oh my God, I've done all this today. Look, I've cleaned, I've made dinner. Um, and you're trying to justify all this stuff because actually it's because you got to feel like, what have I achieved today? Um, so look, don't feel bad, because that's how we all feel. Um, and it's okay to say, I feel lost. And it's okay to say, um, I need help, because you get to this point where you really do hit rock bottom, and you think, my God, there is no way out of this. However, even though this sounds really bad, the sense of desperation and despair, there is hope. Um, because this guy here, um, I remember reading this story in, in the UK Telegraph, it must have been about only three months ago when I was back there. He was a sergeant major, been in the army all his life, all these great skills. Came out and thought, yeah, I'm going to get into like you know civil society uh, and, and work for real people outside of the defence force. Uh, he couldn't find a job. He had 500 rejections. Um, and then in the end, he stood on a roundabout with this sign. Of course, maybe you'd do some really cool social media stuff now, but you know, again, we're of the generation where signs still work. Um, and we stand at roundabouts. And he got a job. Um, and that was really great. But rejection does happen. And so when sometimes when I've lost jobs, you know, we are quite confident in who we are as a person. Um, but it slowly eats away at you because for every rejection you get, and sometimes you literally will read a job ad and you go, that is my dream role. It just speaks to me. And you apply for it. Um, I always say, because I've been in recruitment as well in the UK, is ring people. Look, ring them, meet them for coffee, because honestly, in today's talent world, or war for talent, you're just an, a, another line and another CV online. Um, so you need to be memorable. Um, yes, you know, we used to do crazy things. Um, we used to attach like lottery tickets or golden kiwi tickets in old days and instant kiwis and all these quick little things to our um, application letters. I remember once applying for a job and their brand, um, their logo was like this really cool ampersand and, uh, which was red or, or with blue. So I got this big blue box and I made this great ampersand and bow and I stuck it on my application. I went charging into the advertising agency and dropped it on the desk. Thought, I'm so cool. I'm so going to get an interview. I did get an interview. Yes. Based on the quirkiness, I didn't get the job. So look, after a while, it just slowly, um, rejection does make us stronger. It doesn't at the time, honestly. You feel like shite. Um, you feel worthless. And you feel like, how could they not choose me? And it's, you just, you actually, you're devastated. But look, there will be someone that will say yes. Um, the other thing that happens during this time is, you know, you get all those messages around that we're overqualified or we're underqualified. You've got too much experience. Oh, no, you've hardly got any experience. Uh, oh, no, we're, we're going to take someone like George in accounts because we're going to bring him through. So really sorry about that. We had to advertise. Sorry to put you through this process, but we always wanted George. It's like, well, great. It's just what we want to hear. So look, um, just feel like that, even though there is a sense of desperation and, and despair, I call it, you've got to try and surround yourself with some cool stuff to keep you going and motivated. So, let's get on to some nice things. Whew. Uh, the top five things. These are the top five things that I reckon um, have helped me through some darkest moments. Um, not just through job losses, but through lots of other things that happen in our life. Look, Sarah touched on them. We all have stories to tell. And that is why I love Sid Waikato, because you stand up and you tell your story. If we got everyone in the room to tell their story, we would be crying, we'll be laughing, we'll be going, oh my God, that's me. And again, we need to tell our stories better. Um, and you guys are of the generation where it is okay to talk and tell stories, whereas we're of the generation where we'd go home and tell mum and dad, oh, just shut up and do your work. Um, so now it feels like, okay, we can share, we can talk. So... One great thing I always say, um, and look, and that definitely happens when you lose a job, it's quite easy to go into this really negative spiral where you'll start to bag that workplace. Oh my God, that guy was such an ass. And people get all, you know, they get all viral on Facebook and they basically just, you know, pour their heart and soul out online. Look, and, and that's great. 
Um, but if, unfortunately, it can also burn us. And I have seen a lot of my friends go through that um, grief cycle. So I always say you've got to talk up, even though you might not really like that person. Because actually, Waikato is a village, and so most of you will know that by living here. And in a village, I mean everyone knows everyone, and you never know where you end up popping back. And that person will pop back in your life. Hopefully, you'll be have to recruit them. That would be the cool thing. You have the decision. But it will happen. New Zealand is a really, really small community. So, um, look, always talk up. And, and that just helps you stay positive because in the end, people see you for being that positive influence rather than actually the person that, oh my God, they're so negative, you know. Um, yes, I do have dark times and yes, people didn't want to hang out with me. Um, but if you stay positive, you then surround yourself with more positive people. So it works. Keep learning. Look, I remember my first mentor I ever had. She was the most amazing female boss in the world. She was my first female boss. Um, I was 19. She just gave me so much um, confidence in who I was and so much better than what I had previously under a male boss. Sorry, guys. Um, but literally, you know, empathy, empathy understanding, <laughs> compassion. But she always told me, you've got to keep learning, Jason. You've just got to keep learning. And I know, you know, your parents say that too. You've got to get a qualification. You can't just go out there and be this hipster. You've got to do cool, real stuff. Go get a job. Get a job, get a qualification. And so literally, I did start my qualification journey. And then... I did it for three years, part-time, uh, and it sucked. And I decided, actually, I don't want to finish this, and I'm going to do my OE. So I never finished my qualification. So when I lost my job two jobs ago, um, <laughs> I decided, actually, I'm going to do something for me. Uh, and I enrolled to do my MBA. And I did my MBA later in life, and it was like this unfinished business for me. Um, because, again, I had a life experience, as, as people say, and I've been through the school of hard knocks. Um, but actually, to get a qualification, the first um, in my whole family to actually get a master's, or the first actually to get any degree, um, was a huge thing for my family. And in the end, I thought I was doing it for me. Because you do it because you feel like, I'm going to prove it to the world. I can, I can be this business person. Um, I know how to do business, but because you just felt like I had never had a qualification, other people were beating me to the gun, I felt like I needed to do it for me, um, or I was going to prove it to the world. But in the end, it just gives you the self-confidence, so, which is fantastic. So please keep learning. Learn new skills. You know, if you lose your job and you've got six weeks till your next job starts, learn a new language. Go travelling. Learn how to cook dim sums, your favourite little dim sums in the world. But do something for you where you feel like... Sorry, I love dim sums. Um, <laughs> I got a lot of cooking classes. Ask Nancy, we did it in Sri Lanka. Um, and then we, mm, dull. Um, so you really got to make sure that you do lots and lots of things that, you know, sure it might not improve your outcome for your role, but it improves you. It makes you feel like that I am moving ahead in something else. And it challenges your brain, which is great. Network, network, network. Look, I talk about that quite a lot. People call me the ultimate schmoozer. Um, I'm at every event. Um, I connect with everyone on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Twitter. I'm a rash. Um, I will respond. Thank you. Um, and I will make sure that people help because I always believe that because people have helped me find my ultimate jobs eventually, and I always do the job I love, that actually I should be sharing that. And I always want people to be in a job they love because I've seen my family being in jobs they hate. Um, and they're down on, and they hate their boss, and it's like you shouldn't be putting yourself in that situation. It gives you stomach ulcers, potentially might lead to cancer, and things just turn all to custard. Um, so just get out of it. Change your life. Um, and it sounds really all right for me to say that now, but it is. It's risky. Like, you know, me and Sarah, we, 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 we're knocking on the other end of the millennium doors. Sorry, Sarah. Um, but we shove ourselves out of our comfort zones. You know, she's about to go live on a canal boat in London. Hello, that's actually quite cool though. You know, so the rest of us now have FOMO, actually. So, um, but you know, it does make you, you've got to push yourself out there. You've got to move sometimes. You're going to have to live in another city. So don't be afraid to go out there. Um, and when you network with others, like you guys do all the time, you feel inspired. You guys come from Seed Waikato of events, you just go, whoa, I just feel so cool now because I'm part of this amazing collective and other people are going through the same thing as me. So definitely network. Look, and this is something you guys are hopefully born to do. You've got to sell yourself, all right? New Zealanders particularly are the worst at selling ourselves. Um, we think that um, everyone should just know stuff about us. They should assume knowledge about us. But you've always got to assume no one knows you. 
They might know your name, but they don't know your skills or your expertise. And so you've really got to make an effort when you're out of work and you're looking for work. And yes, um, some of you, I have had a quick look on your profiles on LinkedIn. You're doing a great job. Others don't even have a face. Um, others actually do have a face, and it's like, you should not put that party photo up there. <laughs> so bad. We know it's a wedding, and you've cut out that person that was your significant other, um, and you've literally got yourself there with a glass of beer, and it's like, it's just not a good look. But anyway... LinkedIn really does, um, I know, LinkedIn is, uh, I call it the grown-ups version of Facebook. Um, look, I was, I've worked in the European market and in the US market and the Kiwi market, and look, recruiters definitely find and find you on LinkedIn. So make sure you do all that cool stuff that you should be doing on LinkedIn. And then lastly, stay true to your values. Um, look, you've really got to sometimes make a real heart or that gut instinct um, a moment that Sarah said, if it doesn't feel right, you don't like the organisation or you don't like the leader that you're potentially going to work for or you will, then you've got to be brave. You really do have to go. Um, and there is plenty of opportunities out there and it will feel sad, but again, if you stay true to yourself, then actually I always say you will sleep better at night and you'll not lie awake wondering, should I? So that's me. Thank you.